Hi everyone and welcome to this online interview as part of our current exhibition, Not That Kind of Needle, Embroidery in Tattoo Art at Gallery 76. So today we'll be chatting with Dr. Matt Lotter about tattoo history and the fascinating overlap between embroidery, tattoos and fashion. So Dr. Matt Lotter is a senior lecturer in art history and director of American studies at the University of Essex in the UK. He's a tattoo historian whose research focuses on Western tattooing from the 17th century to the present day and has lectured at the Victoria and Albert Museum, the National Museum of Scotland and the Museum of London. He's a TV presenter and curator of the exhibition British Tattoo Art Revealed. Uh, he's a font of knowledge on all things tattoo uh, and we are delighted to talk to him today uh, as part of our current exhibition. So thank you so much for joining us Matt uh, and for taking the time out of your, your busy schedule. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, it's it's um it's always a pleasure to, to talk to people about about things like this, and I'm really excited about your exhibition. Um, it's just a shame that I can't be there. Yes, obviously we would love to have you here in in person, <laughs> but so you're in the UK and and we are in lockdown in Sydney, so um the exhibition is up online virtually if you want to see a short eight minute version. But we're hoping to put it back up on the walls in December when we reopen, God willing. Um, so to kick us off, Matt, you're a tattoo historian. When did you when do you first remember becoming interested in tattoos or, you know, when did they first, you know, come across your radar, so to speak? Yeah, I mean, I tell I tell this story quite a lot. Like when I, when I was a kid, um, my uh, my uh, uh, uncle had a had a big anchor tattoo on his arm. He'd been in the um, Australian Navy, actually, as it happened. And um, my uncle Mick, uh, God rest his soul. And uh, you know, I was surrounded. It was the nineteen uh, eighties. I was surrounded by kind of tattooed uh, wrestlers and members of um, you know hair hair metal bands, uh, who I really you know, thought were cool. And um, yeah, my uh, grandparents, in order to kind of dissuade me from getting tattooed, like told me two stories, uh, both intended to warn me off. Uh, getting tattooed but both of which I guess set me on this path the, f the first was my my granddad who was a submariner in the Dutch navy during world war ii and he told me that um he woke up drunk on his rum ration uh during um a bit of shore leave in in Indonesia and they were about to tattoo a fly on the end of his nose and he woke up just in time and didn't get tattooed <laughs> And then my um, my my great grandma, uh, apparently on the um, English side of my family, she had um, been tattooed by her younger brother around 1900. He'd come home one day from school or wherever with a tattoo machine that he'd got from somewhere and said, hey, little sister, can I tattoo you? And she said, will it come off? And he said, uh, yes. <laughs> so she apparently had her initials tattooed in her arm. Um, uh, E.D. Her name was Ethel in Derby. Um, she actually immigrated to Australia as well. And so uh, she apparently had to like the whole time in the hot Australian summers, like keep her long sleeves and keep it covered up because she was so kind of ashamed of having this mark on her arm. But yeah, they're the things that, you know, that really sort of set me on the path. You tell a kid not to jump in a puddle and uh, in puddles, they will jump. Next minute, yeah. <laughs> I love that. I mean, it, there's, there's really not a more Australian story than getting drunk on your rum ration and then ending up in a tattoo, you know, pile of chair. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Yeah, all you know, my, the, the, my, yeah, my, my, my grandparents met in, met in, um, in Australia after the war, and I think, yeah, that, that the Australian part of the story always just makes sense to me, you know. Yeah. <laughs> It just checks out. Yeah. Well, there you go. So many Australian connections. But given this maybe inauspicious beginning with your 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 tattoo journey, you know, at what point did you start to get interested in them maybe more seriously and start to consider them as, as a valid area of study for, you know, art historians? Yeah, well, I so I was a tattoo, you know, fan, tattoo kind of, uh, you know, collector, I guess, first and then and acad academia second. So mm. academia was a way for me to figure out um more about tattoo history really it wasn't like I was kind of an academic and then thought what should I study and that a lot of people have done that and that's sort mm. of been the problem so I got into tattooing super young I was I wasn't getting tattooed actually but I was I was like buying tattoo magazines I was going to London and buying punk records and, and getting import tattoo magazines at the same mm. time getting really interested in tattooing and the tattooing that um I saw around me you know didn't really match all the amazing tattooing that I saw in these magazines that I was buying um 
And so I, you know, I started trying to figure out more and more about tattoo history. I was reading some of those really early like tattoo history publications. And yeah, the more I looked, I guess, the less I found, you know, and mm. certainly when I started getting tattooed in my 20s, when I was at uni, uh, the, the, the academic stuff on, on tattooing didn't really seem to match the things that I'd read in, in, in vernacular population uh, publications mm. and, and from my own knowledge. And so, you know, all good PhD projects begin with that. You have a question and you just keep trying to answer it. And I think for me, that was the starting point. It was like, you know, what to make, how do I make sense of tattooing? Because all of this stuff I'm reading is saying it's a mark of criminality and deviance and it's, uh, you know, a kind of psychological flaw and all this stuff. And actually what I, what I saw instead was that tattooing was this beautiful art form and mm. um, with, with a really long complicated history and so, yeah, I, I happened to, I'd never done art history before. I met an art historian um, while doing my master's degree. Uh, and she was like, come do a PhD in art history. That will probably help you make sense of this stuff. And I was like, oh, I don't think I know anything about art, but sure. <laughs> and here we are, you know, that was um, 20 years ago, basically. And um, and here we are now. Yeah, like, you know, and my, my first question, and this is really, I guess, pertinent to your exhibition. I was going to do my PhD initially, I was kind of interested in you know what it meant to be an, an artwork in the world right I was mm. super interested in this idea quite kind of philosophical I suppose of you know what it would mean to be a kind of embodied artwork and then the first part of that I suppose is how how is tattooing art or, or does tattooing cross over with art in any meaningful way and uh, that that for, that was going to be the first chapter of my PhD and I'm still working on that problem <laughs> 20 <laughs> years later that's, I love that you just went straight from like, you know, I'm interested in it to like, let's go straight to the PhD in art history and we'll tackle it. Yeah, there. well, I have, I have ADHD, right? So we, so, so we have like, like hyper-focus is a, yeah. is a, you know, getting I think you need that back, Damia, just objectively. Yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot of ADHD um, people in, in, in academia. And I think like, you know, my, this is taking hyper-focus too far, really. <laughs> yeah. No, it's really interesting about the sort of embodied art um, side of what what is art. And it's interesting, again, for us, because, you know, as a textile gallery, we're often fighting against maybe it's the, I don't know, the opposite stereotypes of tattoo artists, but we have this kind of um, world perception of being often like a craft rather than an art. Uh, and obviously it's both and it can be either. But I think people hear embroidery and their brain goes straight to, you know, grandma's doilies. Um, yeah. And I feel like maybe there's a similar reluctance to acknowledge tattoos as as an art form, um, but we've found, you know, as a, as a gallery space, by presenting textile works in a kind of traditional minimalist gallery zone, it kind of gives people the space to almost like reframe their thinking around it, even if it's the same object, you know, um, and they kind of have the, the, the opportunity to perceive it as art um, and reframe their thoughts around the medium. And, you know, not to say that galleries or museums should be the cultural you know, gatekeepers of what is art. Um, but I just think it kind of gives people the space to be like, oh, I get it. I get that it is art. Yeah. And then to kind of see things in a new way, you know, in real life. So have you found that yeah. with your current exhibition and or? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's such a kind of fascinating and, and important thing, right? Because yeah, exactly the same things happened. What, where I got to, so because I, I didn't know much about art history when I started studying it and actually, this was a real breakthrough for me to realize that for like for the sort of a lot of writing about tattooing and art and this is true of embroidery and art too um a lot of a lot of it is done by people who aren't specialists uh in in art theory or art history and and the claims for art the status of art are always made on kind of you know aesthetic and quality and almost kind of um you know, uh, technical grounds, and they're bestowing this kind of honorific of art on us. Yeah, it's, it, it is really art. Yeah. And actually, what I want to do with tattooing, and I think it's, and what art history as a set of methods really does, is actually art historians in general aren't really interested in like whether something is or is not art, right? Mm -hmm. And certainly we're not um, invested in the idea as lots of the general public might be in the idea that art equals good. <laughs> um, or art equals beautiful because mm -hmm. actually what art history is uh, is a method to 
just analyze a, a, something that people have made um, and figure out what it tells us about the people that made it, the time and cultural context in which it was made, and about us as viewers, as, as human beings who observe these things. And that and art history, weirdly, for tattooing, and I guess for embroidery too, gives us a space actually to, to actually talk about the, the, these visual phenomena in, in, their, in all their complexities. And actually, you know, um, uh, Nelson Goodman, the art historian said, you know, um, uh, being, uh, being art doesn't mean necessarily being good. And of course, what an art historical language gives us is a way of talking about the differences actually between, let's say, a very aesthetically complex, expensive, you know, artistic back piece done in Japan and a kind of, you know, schoolboy uh, or a schoolgirl at the back of a, um, a boring maths lesson with a pencil sharpener. Uh, you know, those yeah. things, like, uh, th if, if you don't kind of like tattooing or you're not interested in tattooing, you might want to say, like, because the, the less aesthetically interesting one is, exists, the whole thing isn't art, or actually you might want to make this kind of distinction, like, one type of tattooing is art and the other type of art stuff isn't art. And actually what the kind of institutional lens of museums and the kind of more written stuff that I do with tattooing is actually allow you to say, what do the tools of art history tell us about this creatively produced thing, you know? Yeah. And that's the insight. Like I'm not, because a lot of tattooists as well, I'm sure this is true of embroiderers as well. They're not interested in calling themselves artists. And, you know, it's not for me to kind of bestow the status of art. <laughs> you must be an artist. <laughs> Exactly. And, and I think that's, that's quite patronising and certainly, again, has been done quite patronisingly mm. over the centuries um, in, in my field. And I'm not, that's not what I'm doing. I never want to claim that tattooing is art. I mm. want to claim that it's comprehensible when you think about tattooing in the same way that we think about other. Yeah, but I'm sure you also have the opposite side of, of some people saying, you know, artists saying, hey, I, I am an artist. I do consider myself an artist and sort of society may be saying, are you or there's that you yeah. could go either way and, and both are fine but it's it's an interesting yeah talking about the the bestowing of this accolade uh, and as you're talking about the the viewers kind of relationship to to making something art or not or considering it art and i love i mean the, the interesting crossovers of course with embroidery in the, at the level of discourse is that you know embroidery is often you know very gendered it's like or, you know, written about as a very gendered practice at least it's a, it's a woman's practice or it's a kind of you know as you said it's a craft practice it's yeah. a it's not something uh, of high art and or if it is high art it's changed from that you know the high art forms of embroidery are different from the the more vernacular forms for some people uh, and certainly mm. even in some of the technical literature that would be the claim uh, and tattooing is the same you know tattooing gets written about as you know, gendered in a different way. It's very male. Uh, it's very, it's, it has a kind of class set of associations. And then the art tattooing, when tattooing becomes art, it's when it becomes not that, you know? Yeah. And, and, again, and again, I think that's a really kind of a false distinction. And it's, and it's a distinction that n not professional art historians, certainly of a, of a particular kind, don't make. And I think it's really helpful to bring this kind of more you know, more, more, more kind of thoughtful set of our historical methods to this kind of practice, because actually it tells, it tells us so much more about the practice mm. than the approaches which are normally used, right? So tattooing, uh, in, in, there's very little art history of tattooing over the, uh, over the centuries. Mm. There's a bit, but not much. Um, and where tattooing has been written about, it's written about by sociologists, it's written about by um, psychologists, criminologists, and actually the art history of it, you know, treating tattooing as, image, as images, where do these images come from, hmm. uh, how do they move through time, what do they tell us about the people and places who consume them, how do they relate to kind of bigger stories, that actually reveals so much. And I've, I've sort of found, I've said this a lot, I found this a bit of an open goal in my career. I feel a bit like I'm stealing a living sometimes because <laughs> this seems like such an obvious thing to say that yeah. tattooing is the visual, it's a visual medium, not a phenomenon. You know, that's another <laughs> phrase I repeat a lot. Tattooing is a medium, not a phenomenon. Uh, but it's written about nearly always as a phenomenon. And treating it as a medium actually unlocks a huge amount and actually completely undermines in some senses some of the, 
existing prejudices that people have mm. um, about the press. And I think, again, I don't know as much about or, or really anything at all about the history of, of the literature about embroidery. I was talking to my friend Amber Butchart the other day about this a bit. Um, but I guess with embroidery too, you know, it, if it's been written about at all, it would have been written about by gender studies historians, it would have been written about by sociologists, and the kind of more visually oriented art history, which can also tell us about things about gender and about social class, but using a different kind of set of tools um, gets lost. So, yeah. No, it's yeah. really interesting. And as you say, a really just, like fascinating sort of framework to look at sort of social history, you know, and it's a whole, hmm. you know, a lot of light it can shed that people don't necessarily go for. But it, it, as you say, like, it seems like an obvious, um, yeah, like thing to explore. But obviously, um, maybe unlike embroidery, there is a sort of mass cultural prejudice in some ways against tattoos. And why? Like in Australia, you know, like although body heart art has like a very incredibly long history with, you know, uh, our indigenous peoples, very significant. Um, but I think tattooing with ink, at least in the mainland, really kind of began um, with the convicts and it's most strongly associated with them. So for us, maybe there's a more obvious kind of like negative connotation. But why has this kind of general prejudice kind of appeared well so that's a super complicated question and we could do a kind of whole hour conversation about that i think yeah. the short version <laughs> yeah the, i mean the, so the, so the short version is really the the very very deep stigma in the anglosphere so mm. in, in 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 english language sources doesn't yeah. really happen uh, in a way that's you know uh, until after the second world war mm. um it's it's bubbling up um, over the course of the 19th century, particularly in Europe, um, for a number of reasons. So in France, for example, the tattooing was banned in the French Navy in the 1860s um, because of a, a hepatitis outbreak, I think, <laughs> at which, which meant, you know, which meant that tattooing was stigmatised in France very quickly. Mm. The intellectual climate of Europe in the 19th century, particularly Italy, Germany and France, uh, was very much more kind of eugenicist than in Britain mm. or, or in a different way. This idea that you could read people's characters on their bodies yeah. um, was particularly in terms of tattooing was, was really strong in Europe and didn't really kick in in, in, in England mm. and America in the same way until much later on. Um, and rather the contrary, actually, in, 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 in Britain, you know, the convict stuff's really, really interesting because in France and Germany, there were all systematic studies of drawing the images that convicts had tattooed on them because those criminologists really believed that the specific images could tell you something about the person, what kind of mm. awful person they were. In fact, you know, one, um, one criminologist or one, one writer about tattooing in the 19th century uh, in Europe said, uh, uh, tattooing is the stigmata of the criminal man. And if a tattooed man dies at liberty, it was only a matter of time before he would have committed a crime. Oh God, so it's if, kind of a born for the gallows situation going on there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. so if you're, if you're tattooed, you're a criminal. And if you're not a criminal, it's only because you died before you got caught, you know? Um, that didn't really happen in Britain. In fact, where we have recorded and the convict stuff's really interesting, they recorded tattooing for, for identificatory purposes. Mm. They were like, you know, we want to see if this person that we're arresting is the same person that's getting arrested the next time, or this person who's enlisted in the Navy, we want to check that they haven't run away um, when we want to get them back. Mm -hmm. um, and so the tattoos were recorded, but only really like descriptions or even you know, marked with ink. Mm. We don't have this kind of real big, big visual record of, of convict tattooing in the same way. Um, and so that's, 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 that's one reason. The other reason is Excuse me. The, um, tattooing just doesn't, uh, you know, the, the, the tattooing that is visible um, is usually not the tattooing on uh, non-stigmatized high-end high people, right? So certainly in the 19th century and particularly after the Second World War, uh, the tattoos that were visible were people were people who were laboring, you know, digging mm. the streets, you know, rolling their sleeves up. If your bank manager or your king was tattooed, uh, you would never see it, mm. um, you know, because people weren't bearing skin in the same way. And so that leads to a kind of what I've called in other places an archival lens problem, uh, mm. where you go looking for tattooing as an academic, you find it in surveilled populations, prison records and yeah. military records mainly. The kind of normal, quote-unquote, history of tattooing is not really visible mm. in the same way. 
Um, and then just in, in everyday life, normal tattooing is not visible um, to people. That's an interesting disconnection, um, therefore, between like uh, tattooing and textiles, you know, that kind of almost like, like, I don't know, yin and yang, <laughs> like when one is one, one is present, the other one is absent to some extent or, or historically was. Yeah, and you know, and, and the interesting thing for me, and this was again the kind of art historical thing for me, like the the professional tattoo industry and the fact that people were making money as tattoo artists in the West begins pretty much coincident with the um, encounters with Japan, and it really becomes possible as a as a profession, like particularly in England, um, uh, because rich people want to get Japanese style tattooing back home. Because everything Japanese is fashionable. Textiles are fashionable, uh, silverware, art in general. Um, and so Japonistic tattooing is kind of, you know, linked in with that bigger artistic art historical moment in time. That's no it. one seems to have really written about that or noticed <laughs> that coincidence before. That on your to-do list of... <laughs> Yeah, well, there's, I've got an article uh, in the work, there's two articles in the works on that at the moment, because it's, right. you know, there is exact continuity between the designs that were being lifted from Japanese print sources for ceramics and mm -hmm. for textiles and the tattoo flash that early professional tattooers were using. So the first, the first kind of arrival of tattooing, although, you know, I, I need to say that not everybody was happy about it. There's, yeah. There was always grumblings and like sniffy articles in the press about what do people think they're doing. But um, it's clear that an industry, you know, the kind of professional pay money to a stranger to get tattooed thing, particularly mm. in cities like London and Paris, um, only exists because rich people want to get tattooed. Uh, so yeah, and you're right. You couldn't make a market for it otherwise. You know, if it's a yeah, yeah. I mean, so before that as well, you know, tattooing even before that period was pretty. It was more complex in terms of its class and gender mix than people think um but you know and it was vernacular people tattooing each other yeah. but you know like public school boys were tattooing each other and you know well, weren't like, they doing really is the question yeah <laughs> exactly and pilgrim like pilgrimage tattooing is a huge thing um very wealthy and you know travelers to the far east from the 17th century so yeah the history is way more complicated than people imagine and actually looking at the images is it helps i think uncover mm. that yeah so interesting and so out of curiosity, so um, if, you know, we're sort of importing in some ways this uh, Japanese tradition and aesthetic, um, at what point, because I, I feel like Japan today is still a little bit hesitant around tattoos, yeah. you know, there's a lot of signs saying, you know, you can't come to the baths if you're tattooed and all that jazz. So when did that kind of switch over yeah. there? Well, so, so tattooing, you know, again, gets very racialized. There is this kind of, in, in English discourse, English language discourse, and, you know, French discourse and Spanish as well. There's this idea really beginning from the, uh, you know, late 15th century when we encounter the Americas yeah. that tattooing is this kind of something from elsewhere, this mm. thing from somewhere else. Actually, if you look at English tattooing, like before and after the encounter with the Pacific, for example, mm. it doesn't change. <laughs> Tatt <laughs> tattooing is like, in terms of the images, is, is pretty much unchanged by encounters with elsewhere. But what happens with Japan so Japan is closed off to the West for a long time or pretty mm. much, you know, Western visitors were not really allowed to go to Japan. Yeah. Trading was very limited. Americans showed up in the 1850s with us with some big ships and went, hey, if you don't trade with us, we're going to invade you <laughs> slash colonize you. Strong argument. And too. The Shogun, yeah. And the Shogunate were like, OK, we'll 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 trade with you and part of that opening up a process called the Meiji restoration yeah. was to try and appear as western as possible as mm. non-foreign because yeah. they thought that the more kind of foreign they looked the more at risk they were of colonization and they probably were not wrong because they weren't they weren't wrong yeah, yeah exactly so t tattooing in japan was was basically banned really quickly wow like in the early 1860s the government were like, this makes us look bad, guys. <laughs> like, this makes us look too old fashioned. Stop it. It also had the kind of ups upswing of like the the, the kind of um, indigenous tattooing in Japan on people like the Ainu and the Okinawan people, which is much more Pacific in character. There was also a kind of drive for like, you know, racial, racialized nationalism in Japan and, and, and suppressing indigenous practice was also a nice side effect of this tattooing ban. Mm -hmm. The actual Japanese tattooing itself wasn't that old at that time. It was only you know, maybe 100, 150 years old okay. in that style that we recognize now. 
But of course, like for foreign visitors, it was like, wow, this yeah. is cool. This is the great, this is what we want. Foreign visitors want old Japan. Yep. And actually there, there was kind of a loophole in the law, which meant it was illegal to tattoo Japanese people, but it wasn't legal to tattoo foreigners. And so all the Japanese tattoo artists either set up shop in the port cities of Japan to tattoo foreigners and advertised in English language guidebooks, or they actually left Japan and started working in Australia, in mm. um, Malta, in Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, Europe, Paris, London, New York, San Francisco, because um, that was the only way they could make a living. Yeah. So there's this kind of really interesting, yeah, crossover between the, the attempts to kind of ban tattooing almost made it m- more exciting <laughs> and yeah. more and more exotic, you know. And and every every royal visitor from Britain to Japan up in, from the 1860s, uh, the Duke of Edinburgh, right the way up to the 1920s at least. Um, uh, uh, Prince Edward were um, were tattooed, and that was well known, and that also yeah. kind of drove the trends, you know. Well, the royalty do everyone will follow, but you know, in our world, yeah, that's exactly. like lace designs, not tattoo designs. But I yeah, love that. But, but those but those things are super connected, though, right? Like Edward the Seventh, mm-hmm. um, you know, who reportedly invented, for example, the kind of modern dinner jacket, you know, kind of suit. Um, he was also like tattooed. Um, George the George the fifth uh tattooed like very uh, this this like this kind of idea that we will follow the royals um yep. in their dining habits you know obviously makes sense with tattooing mm. it, um, is, it almost becomes more and more confusing as to why there's still any prejudice around it or you know hesitation yeah. <laughs> it's just you know when you when you have this sort of early 1900s history of like royalties pro it you know what happened <laughs> well I think so I think what happens is when people are writing about this stuff and in the period when the stigma is kind of increasing over the course of the early part of the 20th century it is a bit like criminals and degenerate aristocrats there's kind of like (laughs) who are these weird posh people because yeah because middle class tattooing is kind of invisible okay yeah again because Um, of the clothing to some extent and the because of the clothing also because their bodies aren't being written about you know no one's kind Mm. of really talking much about middle class tattooing, although it must exist because there are tattooers making a living yeah um what happens really is yeah tattooing is increasingly racialized mm. over the first half of the 20th century and then when when um the second world war happens of course you have a se- several things happen at once all of the hor- horrible horrors of the concentration camps yeah. in the nazi regime come out and tattooing becomes associated with really associated with stigma yeah totally um in 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 uh, in, in that sense and also mm. just fashions change right yeah. so in the 1950s um all of that chintzy victorian and art deco stuff is just out and everything from clothing to furniture to automobiles to you know um, just industrial design just becomes sleek and monochrome and clean and Mm. so all that kind of chintzy sailor tattooing kind of look or all the big complicated decorative japanese style tattooing stuff it's just not very trendy yeah you know and it's there's that as well yeah um that the 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 uh, plus of course as I said this the tattooing that is visible is is of a certain kind and all of those things kind of combine to create this kind you know, the, of the, contemporary contemporary prejudice of yeah exactly but as I say it's, it's a visual story it's a story it's a story as much of as much a visual and the politics of the visual as as much as it is a story about um you know uh the soci- sociological story of that period would be much less visually uh, oriented it would just be kind of you know tattooing was a practice that only criminals and working class people did yeah yeah no that's um, so interesting and wrong, um, there were loads of there were loads of criminals and sailors and, and working class people getting tattooed yeah. and you know, probably well, definitely more working class and more men tattooed than women in that period but yeah. when you look at it visually and think about it in the context of what what's happening in the rest of culture yeah. um I saw the story becomes more interesting and more complicated I think yeah, yeah, that main that mainstream narrative is not entirely false, false but not entirely the whole picture either. Um, I thought it was interesting that you mentioned um, uh, the concentration camps because one of the artists in our exhibition, Andrea Kopeska um, from Slovakia, so she has very um, traditional Slovakian embroidery patterns that she uses in her tattoo art, and for her, she's found that as a sort of it's a deliberate way to sort of combat. Um, the prejudice and misunderstanding from that old generation who I think 
in their case, mostly associate tattoos with um, like the prison tattoos of, of the communist regime. But it's interesting that by pairing with, with this really traditional, um, quite feminine, safe, domestic aesthetic, she's trying to sort of fight back against that, against those, um, those stereotypes and, and associations. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not, I don't know, I'm not a super expert of the tattoo history of, of Eastern Europe, but I know that under most of the regimes, it was banned or certainly kind of frowned upon. Mm. Um, I had a great conversation many years ago with a Polish tattoo collector, tattooer, guy that published a magazine in Poland, and he was telling me that, yeah, like tattooing was you know, pretty much illegal underground in, in Poland. And I think, yeah, and certainly that's also the kind of thing that's going to drive those links with with criminality right yeah. like when tattooing itself is illegal yeah um it, it tattoo <laughs> you shops have to be some persuasion spaces. to go there yeah <laughs> yeah and that's what happened that's what happened in japan too you know mm. you come back to that question like in japan tattooing was obviously illegal and so uh or, or it was attempted to be illegal and it kind of came and went but but the, the real link with criminality didn't happen until again the kind of middle of the 20th century to be honest with you mm. um because because it was an increasingly stigmatized practice and then that that spirals of course yeah no it's so interesting and quite it's quite a recent history which is just yeah again not I think what most people uh, would expect um so in terms of yeah. embroidery in tattoos um like we, we've sort of started to see this trend over the last few years and um you know of artists kind of recreating embroidery and ink which is why we decided to put this little exhibition together yeah. but as someone who is more kind of on the pulse of, of all things tattoo. Is this something you've seen coming up or is this an old thing that we've just Well, missed? look, I'm a, I'm a middle-aged man and be a historian. So more interested in the past than the present. <laughs> so, um, you know, like, yeah, I, I, I always kind of um, worry about passing judgment on, on what's happening in tattooing now, because I'm mm. much more attuned to what was happening in tattooing. Yeah. Back in, <laughs> so back you were the 1860s, the all on yeah, it. That, that might've been, yeah, but, it's what I really love is obviously tattooing now um, is much more open and much more visible. So I always say, you know, tattooing, uh, the standard story will have been that tattooing is like not just for sailors anymore. It's kind of tattooing used to be this. Now it's this tattooing. The story that tattooing used to be something particular is now completely changed is something I want to fight against always. Yeah. Um, there's not some mythical past when tattooing was like just for sailors or just for criminals or just for men or whatever mm. and some present now where it's like all of a sudden super fashionable um but what is true is that although the present of tattooing is connected to the past inseverably it is true that things more visible now um it's much more kind of accessible in so many ways it's visible online of course it's visible on people's bodies in a way because of clothing trends and th and tattoo placement choices changing and all of that has driven just this amazing amount of, you know, artistic interest, you know, mm. straightforward, you know, kind of institutional artistic interest in tattooing. Um, more and more tattoo, just because more and more kids are going to university now um, and, and college, so many more tattooers now have art school training. Mm. You know, that's something that's been happening for a long time. You know, some of the early 20th century tattooers had some art school training and certainly thought about themselves as artists. But yeah. I wouldn't, I don't know if it's the majority now, but certainly lots and lots of tattoo artists, young tattooists have, just have a kind of basic yeah. uh, training and draftsmanship and, and stuff. And all of that is just, and, and we've also had improvements in technology. So tattoo machines actually haven't changed a lot since they were invented, but they are certainly more reliable. Needles are more, you know, people are using single use needles now um, in tattooing rather than as one old tattooer told me, in the 1960s, you'd go to get tattooed at the beginning of the month because that's when they changed their needles. Oh, that's... <laughs> <laughs> um, inks have become uh, more predictable and more kind of commercial and safer and things. So all of that means is that just the quality of tattooing has improved. Mm. And whilst there were, there were certainly artists back in the 19th century doing beautiful, intricate work, the level of kind of, of, of intricacy and detail that the artists are getting now um, consistently yeah. in the skin is astonishing. Yeah. And so all of that is a way around saying, you know, that is one of the things that's really driven this, this kind of moment. The, the thing to say as well, though, is that, you know, stuff like embroidery tattooing, it's a good trompe l'oeil, it's a good little visual gag, you know? And that's something that does have a history. I mean, I was one of the guys that I'm really obsessed with, who was one of the first perhaps the first kind of pro tattooer in England, because Sutherland MacDonald, like he used to tell a story that 
he tattooed a pair of socks on a guy and then the guy got shot in the foot in the war and when he came back from mobile one and when he came back from mobile one he had to get his socks darned you know so he had to like tattoo an image of a kind yeah, of around you know, the bullet darling, hole or whatever <laughs> around the bullet hole yeah so so these kind of gags this kind of visual um you know these kind of visual kind of mm. tricks these little trump loy games are yeah. something that, that tattooers have been interested in for a long time and it's it's super fun to see contemporary artists doing that yeah yeah like, like the patch tattoos also, are crazy you're, you're literally looking at them like oh that that's not so and okay like it's, yeah. it's mental and, and of course like the politics of that as well right as you said because tattooing has been gendered so particularly in one direction in the discourse um and embroidery has been gendered so much in the other direction yeah. There's something really political and playful and powerful about that intersection of of, of style. Yeah. Um, and I think that, again, the, the kind of, and this is what I think is so great about your exhibition is that's really what you're doing. You're telling a kind of polit a, a visual political story about um, both about Brody Rand, about tattooing um, and about contemporary culture and about museums and stuff uh, all at the same time. Thank you. Yeah. So just to quickly backtrack to the, the history side of it again. Um, so there's obviously, a, a, you know, a link between tattooing and embroidery as decorative art forms, and they both mm. involve, you know, adorning the body, they both involve a needle. But, you know, where, where does that historical connection start? Does it go any deeper than that? Yeah, I mean, so again, this is what I think, because obviously, like, when when tattooing has been written about, particularly by journalists uh, over the centuries, it's often been analogized with things like embroidery because yeah. obviously the kind of straightforward you know using a needle to make an image kind of story makes sense um and of course certainly in those kind of convicts uh, settings you were talking about mm. sailors even kind of early pros they were really using sewing needles you know now tattoo needles are made specially yeah. um but for you know if you were a sailor in the 18th century you'd have a kind of sewing kit for fixing yep. sails for sewing your socks whatever and we find a lot of embroidery of course in maritime handicrafts in fact there's yep. great lots of great new research about the kind of queerness of that and actually and the masculinity of that actually um when sailors are bored and the, the wind's not blowing and they've done all their chores <laughs> they've got a needle some of them are going to sew some of them are going to scratch love tokens and tobacco tins and some of them are going to tattoo yeah Oh, you know so okay. there's a there's a very direct kind of you know material analogy between mm. the sewing needle and the tattooing needle yeah and in fact you know and that's that's in that's in the western tradition in, in, in other cultural traditions that is the same as well you know the, the most obvious one is in tattooing across the arctic in um, in various inuit tattooing traditions many of them um were stitched were sewn um and stitched isn't quite the right word they were sewn um, the, the women who did the tattooing and, and tattooing in those in that cultural context is very uh, a, a, a woman's practice, both doing it and receiving it. They would um, have a kind of a sinew of 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 of, of um, some kind of you know thread or pelt or something, and you thread it through. You coat that in ink, and you thread it through the skin. Literally pull the thread through, and it would create a kind of dot dash kind of pattern. You know, it gets called kind of skin stitching. It's, it's not quite stitching. It's more kind of sewing. Mm. Um, uh, uh, there's really amazing work being done to try and revive these practices that were really wiped out, you know, yeah, systematically okay. wiped out by Christian missionaries in the mm. 18th century and afterwards. So a lot of the knowledge about these practices have been lost. But basically, yeah, this, this kind of deliberate skin stitching or skin sewing kind yeah. of practice is something that which 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 is embedded very deeply in certain tattoo yeah tradition. no that's so interesting and is it like you can you could use an embroidery needle like it's a sharp sharp object like in some ways absolutely one's as good as another or would have been back when that was a yeah yeah and, <laughs> and, and yeah, it's, a real, it's a real problem for historians of of a very um you know a, a very deep historical tr tattoo traditions which i am not really i know you know i know about more about them than most people but i wouldn't claim to be an expert in arctic tattooing or in pacific tattooing or in or in any other real t tattoo tradition but people who work on that stuff um you know have a real trouble in the archaeological record because trying to distinguish particularly where cultures have used single needle tattoo mm. practices to try and tell what a tattoo what is a tattooing needle Mm. And what is a needle for embroidery or sewing is yeah. almost impossible. And there's lots yeah. of argument, you know, in the Pacific, for example, 
uh, tattooing was done with um, you know needle with kind of comb type groupings. Right. Obviously, not the kind of thing that you'd use to to embroider. But in many places where tattooing was more single point, mm. if you find a needle, particularly if it's metal and so it hasn't, it's difficult to get wear pattern analysis on it. Yeah, you yeah. really can't tell very easily or at all if it's a tattooing needle or a, any other kind of needle. Yeah. My, my friend Aaron uh, Dieter Wolf, in who works on the history of tattooing in the Americas amongst native populations, mm -hmm. particularly in Tennessee, he actually worked out that you could look at needles made from bone. And lots yep. of Native American tattoo needles are made from turkey bones. And you could look at them under a microscope and you could tell the difference basically between those that were used to tattoo the skin and those that were used to sew because the wear patterns would be different. Okay, there's, like a, there's not like a residue and... or something in the bone, it's the wear patterns they'd also, of it. They, they'd also have pigmentation on them in a particular way if they yeah. were tattoo needles as well. Yeah, and he, he designed, he did that by making replica needles and tattooing himself with them and then analyzing the differences. But what, what that's done, you know, um, the, anthropologists surmise that tattooing as a, you know, as a, as a, as a phenomenon, you know, the piercing of the skull, marking of the skin with ink goes back maybe a hundred thousand years. The oldest yeah. ones we found, actual preserved skins we found only go back about five and a half thousand years. Um, so before that, before we have preserved skins, we have to look at kind of other things in the archaeological record. And what we're looking at a lot is needles and it's really difficult to, to tell yeah. What were, and, and of course, maybe the same, like with our sailors, the same, there may not be a difference. It may not be a kind of tattoo needle and a sewing needle. It might be the same. Might be the object. same one. Literally Interestingly, the same this is the same problem that textile historians have in that the archaeological record is quite biased. The, you know, that what, yeah. what does survive might be a needle, but of course the textiles don't survive. So we have the same problem, like the skin doesn't survive, the textiles don't survive. We have yeah. no idea what these Even are. is this, yeah, even is this a needle at all? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's, it's, Common problem, apparently. So we've chatted a bit about women and tattooing across the yeah. um, the chat. So as a textile sort of gallery, as you said, we, we end up working with a lot of female artists. Like obviously, we've got loads of fantastic artists of all genders working in, in the textile embroidery medium, but it still seems to be a medium that is preferred by female artists because of this sort of historic cultural connections to, as what you said, was sort of considered, you know, women's work or, or women's craft. Um, whereas, as you mentioned, um, tattooing has always seemed quite a masculine medium to me, and I'm sure that's hugely ill-informed, and you said it seems to be just more hidden maybe in women, but yeah, um, yeah it, it's interesting that, in, at least in our exhibition, because of the perhaps the embroidery theme, a lot of the artists we have, not all, but most, are, are female tattoo artists, and yeah. I'd say again, not majority, but not all of their clients seem to be women as well, um, and they seem to be finding some kind of significance in the kind of cultural women's history of embroidery, but then kind of embodying that. Um, so that's kind of my perception of it, but can you speak to the history of women's involvement in tattooing a bit more generally? Yeah, I mean, um, so again, you know, in, in, in some many cultural traditions around the world and in history, tattooing was exclusively a female practice or predominantly, you know, yeah. that's true in some North African tattoo traditions. Yeah. It's true in the arctic for example it's true yeah, in some yeah. but not all pacific culture cultures um in the west you know some of the earliest um indications we have of, of tattooing actually include stories of female tattooers okay. um so there's a great article in a in the national police gazette in the u.s called it's called something like the tattooing freak and it's uh like it's a cover image of a woman in a beautiful kind of mid 19th century late 19th century uh, dress getting tattooed by another woman on the ankle and this this uh this kind of gonzo journalist goes and it's like oh my god you never guess what women are getting up to behind <laughs> closed doors um and weirdly and again quite pruriently and this is again more of a probably more of a of, of a lens problem than a, a reality but lots of the writing about tattooing in the newspapers are about not so much about women doing tattoos but certainly women getting tattoos in many right. cases it, it's often a good excuse to publish pictures of women with fewer clothes on than would otherwise be published in the 19th and early 20th century yep. press um and also it's a good you know you'll never guess what we're, it's that kind of moral panic about what the hell are women up to yeah <laughs> um <laughs> there we don't unfortunately you know that there, there, there are kind of real 
big bold characters of of, of tattoo history in, in in England and in the US um who were uh, you know sort of bestrode this kind of um prejudice so mm. uh, Millie Hull in in America for example or Jesse Knight in in England uh, or in the UK um who who are known but there are so many other women whose names are just completely lost or, or, or that where we know about them they like there are several women for example on the English census from like 1901 1911 where they they there are very few tattooers on the census even but yeah. th those yeah. that are there some of them we just have their names and it says yeah. so-and-so name you know um, and then profession tattooer or tattoo artist. okay I mean nothing about they are, they nothing are else working about that early on that is a thing yeah um you know many female tattooers are working with husbands um the a woman called annie kitteridge for example was the only female tattooer in the london street directory in 1917 in the south london street directory, and her husband had been a tattooer maybe he would maybe he was in prison or we'd gone off to fight or something yeah and she was left running the shop yeah and there's lots of stories of women who were tattooing you know they would work in concert with their husbands um tattooing you know the, the husband would do the outline and they do the coloring in or the other way around maybe the husband was too pissed or too busy. Is the hard part. <laughs> yeah yeah exactly right um and so women have like really been customers of tattooing for a long time mm. because of course you know actually decoration and consumption of of ornament is also a very gendered thing in in, in western cultural traditions and so it's really no surprise that it's women who are getting decorative tattooing. Mm. Um, but yeah, like, I think the tattooing certainly in, in the UK and in the US has skewed male, um, but there's always been more women involved than people yeah, uh, imagined. Yeah. And I think what's happened in the, and again, this would, be a, this would be a guess, and this is more a sociological question than an art historical one, but I think what's happened probably in recent decades is that particularly as tattooing has become more professionalized in some senses that we have more women um, entering the profession. That's probably because again, the, 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 the fact of going to art school is much more female heavy than it used to be. Yeah. You know, um, that's, that's a 20th century problem. Kids doing art at school mm. um, and at college and at university is overwhelmingly male studying art history overwhelmingly female as well mm. just art is gendered in western culture and, and probably getting more so um it towards women than it ever was in the past mm. and i think those things are working in working in parallel to to, to see what you see today yeah which is really interesting very, very yeah it's almost like swung the other way the pendulum to some extent um yeah yeah and yeah you mentioned i mean you mentioned before the um the criminal records obviously all, all the australian convicts always had very detailed records of all their physical appearances and any tattoos and I think there was a study done of Australian uh convicts uh, arrivals and it was something like 37 percent of men but like 15 percent of female convicts had yeah. tattoos of some sort which was incredibly high um percentage wise yeah. I think for the time so I, I don't know what this current stats are today but I'd, I'd be surprised if they were that much higher to some extent well I think yeah so so that there's a website um which your viewers or anyone watching this can look up uh which is a big research project done funded by the AHRC it's amazing it's called digital panopticon digitalpanopticon.org right. okay. and it's kind of a collation of prison records and convict transport records Okay. um from the late 18th to the early 20th century and and what they've done is really sort of made these big data visualizations of tattooing where possible so right. by and you can you can make visualizations by gender by even by design like see okay. the kind of things people are getting tattooed on them by um by all kinds of things and yeah like what what i always think is interesting about the, the convict records is that then and the convict tattooing actually is it's not just tattoos on convicts it's tattoos on real people some of whom happen to have been convicted of crimes yeah right so we we do get a sense that there's a vernacular history sort of invisible vernacular history perhaps yep. underneath that my i think and again it's really difficult to get good statistics on this i think the gender split now is about 50 50 okay and yep. has been probably for about a decade or so uh, maybe even more um mm. I think even back just off the top of my head now I think even back in 2003 I think it was about 
50 50 and okay. the numbers of people tattooed is in the west w- was about a third has been a, for a long time i think it's probably a bit more than that now okay. certainly amongst younger people yeah yeah that would skew um, it slightly yeah. yeah yeah no really really interesting um oh yeah we should we'll, we'll put the link to that um that uh, study in, yeah. in the, in the it's great yeah it's great it's, a great it's fun to play with and you know um the, the academics that put it together i wasn't involved in putting it together but i i did speak to them shortly before they published some of their results and help them put some of it into context and mm. you know it's a great tool um not just for actually looking at gender but looking at because that they do where possible pull out design so you can look at kind of trends over time of of different images yeah you can even because convicts are recorded very roughly and not entirely analogously with the categories today, but they are recorded by race, for example. So you can look at kind of an interesting, similarly mm. invisible racial racial history of Western tattooing. Um, yeah. And yeah, it's, it's an amazing project and super yeah, useful. Yeah, cool. No, so we'll, we'll touch that link for everyone to have a have a quick squeeze at. Um, but you're currently working on a project on the link between tattooing and fashion, if that's correct. So what got you yeah. started on this project? Well, this is so my my one of the big themes of my work, really, one of the kind of big unifying ideas, if I w- would c- could be so grand about it. Um, and again, it's not really that unsurprising or unobvious an idea is that tattooing is connected to the visual cultures yeah. from which it emerges. Again, it seems quite straightforward, not something that really anyone's ever properly written about before. Um, but, you know, the fact that tattooing reflects the images that people wear on their clothing, hang on their walls, um, you know, it is a straightforward but kind of underexplored um, idea. Mm. And of course, like as part of that, uh, also tattooing has always been written about as a fashion. You know, tattooing is fashionable. If it is a fashion, it's been the kind of longest fashion you know, ever, <laughs> basically. <laughs> but, but of course, what is fashionable is not tattooing itself, tattooing per se, tattooing is a phenomenon, but the, the image, the kind of images that people get tattooed on them. Mm. And actually, I was getting tattooed the other day, funnily enough, and the t- tattooer said to me, like, oh, it's really amazing. You can see, like, you know how long you've been getting tattooed because you can see how the different designs change on your body. You're like, yeah, yeah, that was done in the early 2000s. That was done, like, in the you know, mid 2000s. Like, that was done two weeks ago. Tattooing images change um, more so than tattooing itself being the trend. And so as part of that, I was chatting to my, my friend um, who's a fashion historian, Amber Butchart. Um, I've worked with her a little bit before and helped her out a little bit uh, with thinking about the relationship between uh, nautical tattooing and sailor handicrafts, okay. um, where these kind of images of like, you know, uh, ships and naval images come into tattooing. As part of that, we started talking about, you know, where tattooing and fashion come into practice. And we, we were doing some work on, on a woman called Elsa Schiaparelli. It's an amazing, important pioneer yeah. of, um, of knitwear and of, of surrealist fashion yeah. uh, in the 1920s and onwards. And, and, and she basically, in her 1929 summer season collection, did a series of um, t- uh, tattoo-themed bathing suits so they were called kind of li- lizarding suits, she called them. So you'd, you'd have these kind of flesh colored, like really kind of flesh colored, almost wow. kind of nude illustration um, bathing suits, which were then embroidered with tattoo designs that she claimed to at least have copied from authentic designs she collected in the Havre and Marseille. And then you'd wear <laughs> your kind how, of, uh, Elsa. <laughs> yeah, and then you'd wear your suits over the top of that. To go also, it's deliberate. It's not a bathing suit per se. It's a you're you're almost you're almost. It's like a it's almost like a tattoo sleeve that you're wearing. Is that the idea? Well, so is- yeah. So it was so so the bathing suits made you look as if you were naked. And in fact, there was you know lots. Again, it's kind of a nice joke. There was lots of conversations in the French press, like you know, as bathing suits were getting skimpier and skimpier over the nineteen twenties. It was like, what next? Women yeah. swimming naked. So. Or, or women tattooing their bathing suits on them. So Schaff really kind of went with that joke in the surrealist spirit of her mm. of her circle and made these things that, yeah, really were meant to kind of give the visual impression that you were na- a naked tattooed person swimming. And then they came with, or they were sort of put on the runway with these kind of jackets and loose trousers that you'd wear. Then you'd put straight over the, the bathing suit to wear to the bar or to, or to dinner or whatever. She called yeah. them their lizarding suits. And... Um, and yeah, so this so so this idea that yeah that tattooing and and high fashion were very linked um, 
as early as 1929, I think was also surprising to me and certainly has been surprised to other people who think that, you know, Jean-Paul Gaultier or maybe Issey Miyake invented tattooing on the runway. Um, and what I love about, about Elsa's thing is that, you know, we know that some of her circle were tattoo. Tattooing was pretty trendy in Paris in the 1920s. Um, and yeah, like, it was a real sensation. The Australian press were like, you'll never guess what's happening in Paris, for example, right? Um, the, we're very, we're French... very conservative. We're constantly shocked by the Parisians. <laughs> yeah, but the, the French Vogue was very like sniffy about it, not because it was tattooing, but because it was, it was a bit decorative. <laughs> it was a bit too gauche. It wasn't very chic. Mm. Um, but, you know, the fashion press uh, and, and the more general kind of fashion reporting in like America and yes, yeah, certainly in Australia um, were like, oh, my God, like, what are they what are they getting up to in Paris? And then, yeah, then you find, again, these these links between tattooing and fashion really, again, throughout the kind of from then onwards, really, there are tattoo kind of knitwear designs by other designers in the 20s and 30s and the 40s, in the 50s, uh, 60s, all the way through. Um, and of course, again, there's this interesting circle happening and this is i think probably true of embroidery as well that you know images that have resonance in cultural imagination as you know as nautical for example they have all that kind of cultural encumbrance of romance and danger and adventure and expl exploration all the things that you know we want to kind of assume for ourselves when we put those designs on our clothing or on our bodies um but then when those designs were, were um, fed into more kind of mainstream cultural imaginations, they became like tattoo designs, even though they'd originated in folk art uh, of various kinds and have never just been exclusively tattoo designs. Um, but then they become tattoo designs and then they take on that kind of cultural resonance of like of tattooing, which is, you know, again, kind of criminality and danger and subculture and yep. sex yep. and, you know, and so there's this kind of interesting Cycle. fashion feedback loop happening. yeah and so you think this is why the designers are incorporating it because these these images kind of become sexy with association with tattoos and therefore they become fashionable and that feeds yeah. that that loop absolutely that absolutely that and and you know sailors were tattooing on those images on them because those images were the kind of fashionable images of their moment or they was just they were the images of their visual culture environments you know their religious images nautical images images that reflect kind of bits of cosmological belief mythological images you know um i, I won't swear because you might get demonetized on this but um our, the, the 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 um the family friendly version of this i've been saying recently that you know the images that people tattoo on themselves in general certainly in, that i'm looking at in a western context are things you love things you hate things you're afraid of or maybe that comes under things you hate and things you want to have sex with yeah <laughs> right basically we'll imagine that's it. what the end version of that was yeah. yeah 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 you can imagine what the saltier version of that was and that's it right yeah and so the images people are tattooing on themselves they're putting on images of stability of home mm. you know of of love of anger you see this a lot in convict tattooing as well um and, and, and then those images, which are very blunt and very straightforward, also work really nicely on clothing because they're, they're not complicated. Yeah. You know, so, so you know, Chaparelli, as I said, was a big surrealist uh, and, and, and was friends with Dali and John Cougdor and uh, all that kind of Parisian surrealist scene. But she wasn't kind of doing surrealist embroidery. She was made or some of this knitwear. She was doing kind of trompe l'oeil. She was playing mm. with the format a bit but the images are quite readable and the joke is quite straightforward in her work. Ditto in the 19th century, um, people who are getting their favorite works of art tattooed are getting French salon pictures or Japanese paintings okay. done. They're not getting kind of Van Gogh tattoos. They're not getting complicated impressions yeah. tattooing. <laughs> um, because, because the resonances of tattooing are much, you know, are much more straightforward and much, blunter um and that's why they get fed into clothing and why they why these images recur in other formats mm, no it's so interesting and so that's clearly a link sort of we think starting of early 20th century ish but would you say there's an, an, any earlier kind of examples of um of that kind of fashion tattoo feedback loop being created or just yeah so well, like, well again i think i think you know um there's a really straightforward overlap between 
um, f- just clothing and tattooing. So, in, so I sort of alluded to it earlier on, but like, you know, more and more people now are getting hands and stuff, tattoo, hands and neck tattooed, visible tattooing, f- facial tattooing is bigger than ever. Um, and, and one of the theories for that is that, you know, that's how we present ourselves on the internet, right? Like if your body's tattooed, you're not showing that. You hold your hands up and yeah, all of us now. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. so there's this kind of interesting link between tattooing and clothing and that goes in both directions. So one of the things I'm really interested in going back to Japan mm-hmm. is that, you know, at the time when, so lots of women who were getting tattooed when they went to Japan, upper class women, upper middle class women getting tattooed, they were getting tattoos on their lower legs mm. and stockings designs from the period are almost exactly equivalent you know, to the kind of things that women were getting tattooed on their legs. And stockings aren't, aren't an invention of Japanese culture, but certainly by that late 19th century period, they were being embroidered with Japanese, Japanesque Orientalist designs. And they're the kind of things people are getting tattooed. And you can, um, lots of, there's you know, very early fashion theory, fashion history writing from the early 20th century um, by anthropologists interested in fashion are making that connection too. Mm. It's like wearing lace makes it look like you're tattooed. Wearing sheer stockings gives the impression of tattooing. That was wrapped up in conversations of that period with, with this proto-eugenicist conversations about the relationship between um you know cultural evolution the idea of course uh, for a long time wrongly incorrectly but was that like western culture was more evolved than cultures elsewhere and many um uh, uh anthropologists of the mid 19th century were saying like actually you could tell how evolved a culture was by whether they'd got to nudity or not you know whether they got to lack of lack of tattooing so you start off with very kind of primitive prim- again this is all none of this yeah, is my century yeah this let's was the, this was the view right primitive cultures where tattooing was very rough then you get let's say new zealand which is like you know the maori tattooing which is very decorative and ornate yeah. but it was still yeah. tattooed then you get to japan which is again more evolved where it's more pictorial and then you get to finally to european culture where they've where we where we wear clothing and we wear uh dress with those designs rather than putting them on our bodies and there is a yeah. sense that like that, that that fashion history existed in a kind of evolutionary continuum with tattoo mm. history again completely erroneously not correctly yeah but that was the idea that was the idea it's fascinating um, that they actually and- divorce it they're like you know they wait for the, we don't want to decorate skin it has to be separate and yet they're still seeing it on the you know, on the on the on the same time. But even even you know even Immanuel Kant or like the um the, the great writer on uh, Victorian ornament uh, Owen Jones, both of those were like, oh hey, like you know look at these look at these Maori facial tattooing, look at these mocha, they are um they're beautiful, but why are you doing it on your face, mm. right? Because there's also this you know this Western Christian idea about about facial beauty as well Mm. which comes to part of this and I think that this is one of the interesting things about what again what I've called this archival lens problem because of course there was a lot of tattooing happening in that period and there were a lot of people tattooed and particularly as we get into the late 19th century but it's not visible and so you can make assumptions if you're an anthropologist about Mm. the kind of people that are tattooed and what that tells us about human nature and what that tells us about cultural evolution um but if you're not really paying attention to the image histories of tattooing for example you're going to make a mistake so you know the, the, this thing with uh, i mentioned this 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 racialization of tattooing and it's it's true in this context uh, particularly and i alluded to it earlier on there is this idea very persistently still although i think in the last sort of few years as uh, colleagues uh, have published and told explicitly people there was this, the tattooing was discovered by Captain Cook in the Pacific. You know, there was no tattooing in Europe. We'd, or if we, if there ever was, there've never been any, or if there ever was, we'd all long forgotten about it. Okay. <laughs> and then we encountered these exotic peoples in, in, in Samoa and Tahiti and New Zealand uh, and Fiji and, and elsewhere in the Pacific. And then we mm. brought tattooing back, we copied it, right? But actually, if you if you look carefully and I, I and others are doing some of this work now, if you look carefully at 
where we have descriptions of, of it wasn't called tattooing it was called marking or pricking with yeah. ink on western bodies in the mid 18th century and the early 19th century it's exactly the same yeah. <laughs> the design history of western tattooing does not change slow, ev slow evolution there yeah and it's not i mean the story really is weirdly how how unaffected by encounters with pacific tattooing western tattooing was very we love few... our anchors you're not taking the anchors from us <laughs> yeah exactly our, our anchors are pierced hearts yeah. our, our jesus is on the cross very few people are getting kind of maori pacific style tattooing on them and of course that really complicates this story of primitiveness and and barbarity mm -hmm. and that you know that that story is really complicated when you look at the image histories of tattooing yeah. um but if you want to tell a kind of racialized story about how your culture is mm. better than the cultures of the people that you're colonizing and enslaving um yeah. you need to sort of say that this tattooing thing is really barbaric yeah and i've i mean i've been really sort of come across that in like ancient history readings like you know the romans have that kind of perception of the the pagan societies or not that you know the, you know those others they they do the yeah. full body tattooing we don't and interestingly mm -hmm. you also mentioned the face and the hands and again I, I think I'm not an ancient historian by any stretch but I think um often at that time you know you would mark a slave with uh yeah. body markings tattoo or otherwise on their face or hands because it's an obvious you know it's a status thing you can see right. whether or not they're free and so in some ways that may have fed into that western narrative of this is a bad place to be marked you know absolutely and and you know so the romans the greeks the han chinese actually even um you know the kind of ethnic uh han, han majority in china they um they were always like we don't tattoo but they did punishment tattooing um uh, they did uh, punitive tattooing, stigmatizing tattooing, mm. um, and and and, other, and branding as well. But but yeah. but, but tattooing uh, for this context, um, in order to sort of say, yeah, like you know the and actually the Persians as well weren't tattooed. Yeah. Those those big classical empires did sort of say, yeah, that the the Scythians, the the Thracians, the um, Sarmatians, that you know. The, the barbarians African, basically as Africans, they would have termed the them yeah. they're the, the 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 british actually yeah. they're the tattooed <laughs> the ones the og barbarians yeah 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 yeah. although weirdly the brits probably weren't tattooed it seems they were more like body painted okay. but um but the romans certainly said that they were tattooed uh because it was a way of differentiating themselves from others we've got um you know for example amazing ceramic wear from uh, ancient Greece, like depicting the Thracians, Thracian women, where, where in in beautiful dresses with their hands and face tattoos visible as in a kind of visual continuum. Um, and of course, again, if you look carefully, there is also evidence of vernacular tattooing, of course, in Greece, in Rome, in um, China, in uh, the Middle East. Okay. But it's a nice cultural story to say we've not got tattoos other people yeah. do or you know of course those other cultures was the same thing they would say we've got tattoos yeah. you don't they're a marker of kind of otherness and actually you know that is again true of tattooing as a medium um so tattooing uh different kind of designs different kind of images all have always been ways of of, of separating individuals from groups and groups from other groups mm. but tattooing as a practice tattooing as a phenomenon is pretty universal sort of seems to happen everywhere always you know it's never it's not always majority cultural it's not always um uh ex culturally acceptable or, or whatever you want to say but it is a practice that's present or seems to me basically everywhere always or, or at least more or less it's always it's always with us um <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah and it, and and I think, yeah, as you said, the stories about decoration and the kind of moral politics of ornament, you know, really drawing upon those kind of Renaissance uh, interpretations of the classical sources or the, or the anti even the kind of early modern, the antiquarian interpretations of early modern sources, they also have fed into contemporary perceptions of, of who gets tattooed and who did get tattooed and who didn't and stuff. And yeah. actually, you know, we look a lot, the more closely we look and the more evidence we have of 
of tattoo histories, the more complicated and the more rich that those stories become, I think. Fantastic. Yeah. And it is such a complicated and rich story, uh, which we'd, we'd better stop our conversation here because I think we could just keep going for <laughs> hours. Um, but if people want to hear more ab about the social history of tattooing or tattoos as art, where would you suggest they go to learn more? So, you know, there is there's just loads and loads. Of, so I, I always sort of say that I'm a conduit, really, for uh, particularly on the 19th and 20th century material. I'm a conduit for um, community knowledge. A lot of stuff that I'm doing uh, uh, and talking about is known about in the community. So um, by books written by tattoo, tattoo collectors, you know, people like uh, Rich Hardy or Paul Ramsbottom or uh, Nick York or Darren Bray. Like this has been a huge, amazing raft of pub publications of beautiful images that have never been seen before. So if that's your kind of vibe, that stuff's great. Yellowbeak Press, Gentleman's Tattoo Flash, the places that sell these books are amazing. If you want the kind of more scholarly side, like I'm publishing things uh, which you can find, you can look me up. Um, uh, I'm doing exhibitions. Um, my The next version of my exhibition is going to be at the National Maritime Museum in Cornwall, like in a smaller version, but in a kind of revised version than it was previously, starting in October 2021 and running through till the end of 2022. Um, uh, good starter books. Um, World Atlas of Tattooing by my friend Anna Friedman is an amazing, great book. And I have got a couple of books coming out in the next year. Yeah. Um, pu publication schedules, notwithstanding. So it's easier now than ever to find to find great tattoo uh, history, although beware a lot of it, because a lot of it, um, particularly for, if it's by academics, a lot of it can be quite bad if you want to also while well, i remember if you want to know more about that kind of really ancient stuff yep the work yep. of aaron dieter wolf lars krutak uh maya suliak maya suliak jacobson um uh is are amazing uh this book's great uh oh, you can't see it it's blurred no. <laughs> ancient ink there you go. ancient ink um is amazing oversight of lots of um beautiful proper serious interdisciplinary work on ancient tattooing and um and yeah like keep an eye on my instagram and my twitters and all that stuff and i post things that are interesting will do so follow you on instagram and twitter head to the library or head to cornwall apparently and um yeah we're all we're all excited to travel again so i feel like that's that's the best, the best option <laughs> there <laughs> um well thank you so much matt for joining us today thank you for getting up so early uh to meet thank us here in global international time uh and we will all certainly um keep looking into um more yeah more about tattoos i think it's a really fascinating conversation and just yeah thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with this community and um we hope to speak to you at some point in the future no it's my pleasure and good luck good luck with the exhibition and good luck with lockdown eh thank you so much okay <laughs>